The Fujicast is an independent loading zone production. The day has arrived. I never thought you you could actually. I, well, I didn't have you down as a vegan. I've got to be honest. But well, neither did I, frankly. Right. How does this make you feel? Hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, we'll be happy this year. Oh, they're down. What do you think about Kev going vegan? I know, I know. I can't believe it either. But you're safe now. They're chuckling at me, you aren't know? they? Look at them. <laughs> You can't even drink wine. I know. I find that funny as well. Yeah, you, there's rubbish. loads of things life, you can't do. Can life you? has gone immediately rubbish overnight. <laughs> what can't you do? What can't you eat? Uh, anything nice. You can't mm. eat anything nice. You can only eat falafels. That's yeah. what I've decided. Do you want to Just falafels. There's some countries that don't really understand um, the vegan and vegetarian diet. See, my, my uh, mother-in-law, she's, um, she's a, a vegan. Uh, is she no, from she's a different f- country? No, 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 no. The story is when they went skiing in uh, Bulgaria when uh, when Sam was a lot lot younger, well, way before our time. Mm. They they um, she was vegetarian, so she she said, "Well, I'm vegetarian. I can't eat anything that's on your menu." And so they said, "Well, okay." And they brought her turkey. <laughs> well, okay. you know, I turkey. remember. That's fine, turkey. That's vegetarian. Oh, <laughs> I, all right. Thank you very much. I remember being at Photokina once, and um, there was a photographer there who was a vegan as well. Right. <laughs> and uh, we went to a German, oh, a German no. uh, no, restaurant, no. and, and it, basically it was uh, curly sausages or nothing, and that was it. <laughs> and he was trying to say to them, "Look, I don't eat salt. I don't eat meat. I don't eat meat." Yeah. And uh, he said, "Have you got any eggs?" And they didn't understand what eggs was. And uh, and in the end, they brought him two. <laughs> finally, after a lot of uh, like uh, conversations, they brought him two plates of fried eggs. And the, the bloke uh, slammed it down on the table. He went here. <laughs> he listened to this. He went here are your horse's eyes. Do you know though? If I had to eat those curly curled up German sausages, I think I'd go vegan. The Fuji Cast. I'm not quite, quite sure about those. Anyway, uh, welcome to the show and uh, to the new to the new vegan man. Um, it, it all changes here. I mean, he's gonna you're gonna sound different. You're gonna smell different. That's for sure. I'm gonna smell different, definitely. <laughs> I'm gonna look different, hopefully. As always, star of the show today is you and your questions on anything at all loosely fo- photo related. Tech is nice, but human is nicer. The show lives on your questions. We love to hear from everyone. So if you have a question and think they'll never read it out, get on that keyboard now. Send it to us and. We'll probably get round to it very soon. Send your question to click at fujicast.co.uk. Uh, today we'll hear from uh, oh, Keith Bernstein. Now, um, imagine this, Kev. First pro gigs you get out on your own as a photographer. The Clash and then Elton John. Mm. And your age, what, 18, I think he was when he did that. Yeah. Um, He's he- such a nice bloke. Well, yeah, he is, very. He was in Somalia and and Mogadishu when the the actual Black Hawks went down. He was a couple of streets down. Yeah. He said he heard, well, he heard the gunfire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's been a personal photographer to Nelson Mandela. He's worked on seven Clint Eastwood films as as the the, the stage stills photographer. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And and he's on the show today. And And he photographed uh, a lot of film covers, hasn't he? Yes, he has, yeah. Including uh, Sully. Uh, uh, did he do Sully? I think so. Oh, I didn't he know he did Sully. Me. I would have asked him about When that. I met him, we, we were at a uh, conference together, yeah. and we both walked into the room, and he had uh, bright red shoes on, and I had my bright red shoes on as well. And, uh, is that your conversation? Quite funny. Look yeah. at my bright red and shoes. So I went to his talk, and it was very, very, very good. And, uh, yeah, amazing guy. Really nice chap. Jaw, jaw, Sony shooter, I think, right? Jaw-dropping stuff. Do you know, I didn't ask him, I, I purposefully didn't ask him what he shot. He, uh, when I spoke to him, or when I saw his um, his talk, I should say, he mm. used to, because he d- does a lot of film stills, obviously, mm. Mm. so he used to shoot with big DSLRs with a blimp on it. Yeah, you that's know, right, those, to those hide the noise. <laughs> basically a carrier bag yeah. around your camera. And uh, and so he went mirrorless when when Sony uh, came to the marketplace. He he went to Sony, and because uh, obviously silent shutters and all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, really nice guy. Well, you know what? I, I really thought I worked hard at that interview. I can see I failed on two counts straight away. I failed on what did I fail on? I failed on uh, asking him about the camera, <coughs> and I failed him on the Sully thing. <coughs> <laughs> I'm going to start doing the interviews. This is you're, you're just you're making the whole thing go wrong. It's so amateur. Yeah. Right. You can launch the question since you're such a pro. Okay, Steve Ford. Good old Steve Ford. He was at the conference. Uh, our Kiwi friend. Um, hi Neil and Kevin. Great show. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> they're still laughing at you. I get a, when I'm really thin, I'll, I'm going to have to. I'm just going to go blue, blue, blue. That's right. Sorry, go on, Steve Ford. Uh, he says, uh, "Who do you look to for inspiration, past mm. and present, to help you with your own work, and why?" Steve from New Zealand, but traveling the world. Yeah. Um, you go. Mine changes every single week. I mean, now it's Keith Bernstein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny when you look at somebody. Um, I said this right at the start of the interview. Um, that that when you when you look at someone's list of things that they've done, things like Keith Bernstein, you think, what the hell have I done with my life? Yeah. I mean, I, it, the list of stuff he's done, but the, the photographs. You um, should stop putting yourself down. You've done amazing yeah. things on YouTube, especially those legacy films and stuff. Oh well, that's very kind of you to say. But yeah. no, no. I mean, photographically, when you when you the, the legacy. I mean, I would imagine the legacy of somebody like Keith Bernstein and Tom Stoddart and um neil you know, james and <laughs> those kind of those kind of people for me i mean imagine carrying that legacy of work through life they're the people i look up to hmm. Definitely. yes well i do too also um you know what i'm i'm actually going to wrap it all up into one and just say i spend an a unhealthy amount of time on the magnum foundation website do you? and it's a rabbit hole of uh, yeah. links and videos and clips and films and pictures obviously pictures and yeah. books and yeah. There's past and present photographers, and so yeah, Magnum for me, I think is 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 the way that I go. Um, obviously, you and I are mainly primarily wedding photographers, mm. and I do. You know, I hate it when you know what I hate when people, other wedding photographers, say I never look at other wedding photographers' work these days mm. um, because they're just lying, um, and they do. He's lying. Yeah, and uh, and so I look at other wedding photographers' work too. Obviously, yeah. mostly I look at it and go, Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you put yourself down, Kev. Uh, yeah, the legacy. Here we go. That's the legacy of a vegan. <laughs> <laughs> don't start um but yeah magnum and uh and and lots of other wedding photographers of course but uh magnum foundation oh. generally is where i i um i cast my rolling eyes while we're talking about magnum next week um uh, we, with with only a couple of weeks to go to christmas we thought we'd do a really cheery cheery episode called um well i i, I don't know whether we should go with the actual title i'm, I'm going to do for the youtube film which is um uh, the, uh, it's either the death of wedding photography or is wedding photography dead big question mark mm. um, but but actually coming out the other side of it i think you're going to be pleased with what you hear but ian weldon is one of those uh, guests on that that show and he he was tipped although he poo-pooed it when i asked him on, on the interview he laughed at me um uh, 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 to be magnum's first wedding photographer even though he says he's not a wedding photographer so there we go. So that's coming up anyway in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, next week, rather. So a nice cheery subject with a couple of weeks to go to Christmas. Hmm. Um, okay, um, this one is from Greg Smith of Huddersfield. Hi, Neil. Hi, Kevin. Love the show. Listen to it every week. Great variety of questions and guests. I was in the Gambia in March on holiday, so all that Gambian stuff has been particularly interesting. Anyway, here's the question. How do you deal with... with what is that noise? <laughs> Can, I, I, it's an aeroplane. It is not my tummy. Can you hear that? It's an aeroplane. Is this your veganism that's going on? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably... Like? Hang on, let me open the window. Hold on. What is that? It's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the lorry going to Malmesbury with all my falafels. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, <clears throat> Greg Smith, let's get to the question. How do you deal with dreadful lighting in venues? I shot a wedding the other day. The whole thing from start to finish was indoors. The venue had no outside windows, so no daylight. It was really, really dark inside. Just lots and lots of coloured spots everywhere. Oh, no, they're the worst, aren't they? Also, they had a very, very high ceiling, so it was tricky to bounce flash off anything. So I'm wondering how you'd go, go, both go about dealing with a situation like that. Thanks, and look forward to you reading out the questions sometime. I have a very, very simple um, system that I operate when I walk into a room like that and see just uh, big up lighters everywhere, no light, and just candlelight. I just get in the car and... <laughs> I'm gone. But no, it is, it is and, and particularly at this time of year, because it happens, doesn't it, when... Normally in winter, the, you know, your clients will say to you, look, we're going to have a really romantic um, wedding. We're just going to light it with candles, nothing else. Who, yeah, but who, who gets married at a wedding venue with literally with no windows? Uh, have you done one with zero windows? Well, I, 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 I actually, that's not true. Well, I'm that not, makes no, no difference in the winter when it's gone dark. Anyway, well, that's true. I'm being, a bit, oh, I'm being a bit disingenuous. Yeah, well, you know, you've got to look for the, the available light that is there if you're using available light. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very tricky. Spot metering is your friend. I think I should have that tattooed on my forehead. Spot metering is your friend. Tat is a, <laughs> spot metering is your friend. That's, that's merch. That's t-shirt worthy. 
The spotlight screen is your friend, I eat falafels. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a theme this week, Only. isn't it? Um, Do you think this will last to Christmas Day? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know you You hope so, that's for sure. <laughs> Kev can eat three of you. Oh, God. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, spot meter in, I think, and just be, you know, be very, very conscious of those, um, those the holy trinity of making a good picture, light yeah. composition and moment. And sometimes, sometimes moment is, uh, you know, trumps the lot. And if you if you have to be shooting at 12,800 ISO, I shoot a lot in the winter mm-hmm. at 12,800 ISO, yeah. then, then go for it and the moment wins. Does um, that then become black and white for you? Not always. Thinking about latitude and digital noise and not always. That kind of Sometimes, thing. but yeah. not always. I mean, more likely to be sure, but but not always. Um, I'm thinking back to the last wedding I did, which was uh, was great actually, and they they had. Uh, do you know what their first dance was? Mm, what Cotton Eye Joe. No, really? It was brilliant. I've never heard that it as was a first time. Absolutely brilliant. Um, really nice couple. And um the yeah, that was that was obviously winter and dark mm. and uh I ended up using my little Lumi Muse uh, LED. Oh you it's uh, the six lamp one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh and it was yeah, it was um yeah, it's tricky, but you just gotta think harder and work harder and uh, and just look forward to the summer. <laughs> <laughs> and don't worry about motion blur. I think I think yeah. people think too much about motion blur. You know, everything's got to be... It's got to be still and, you know... Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be... Pin sharp. No. no. Um, uh, you're right about the moment. I think at that at that time... I, 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 I Go and look at the Magnum site. Look at all their yeah, pictures. Very very rarely will a, will a client think, oh, there's slight motion blur there. That, that moment would have been so much better had you just not had that motion blur. Stick the ISO up. Yeah. And yeah. go for it. There you go. That's okay. the answer. Your question. Uh, okay, I have one from uh, Martino. He says, "Hi, Neil and Kevin. This is quite a long one." Uh, here, Martino from the north of Italy. Dig I have in. I have been listening to your show from the beginning, and it has become my favourite for pod, for top for popography <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I won't edit that. <laughs> <laughs> One year, I got his name right as well, and then I couldn't even say the word. You did. I was about to give you a for, for the name because usually we go in the other way, aren't we? Uh, it's because I'm hungry. One year ago, I became <laughs> father of a lovely daughter, and a lot of things in my photography habits have changed since then. When my baby arrived, I owned an XT2 and a X100F. Recently, I've bought an X70 because of the tilt screen, and it is awesome. But with a child, obviously, I miss the speed of the XT2 and Acros Film Simulation. Toddlers are very unpredictable, and I find the speed of the X-T2 a very big advantage during shooting sessions. I really like street shooting with the X-100F, but it is currently always in my backpack. Is, in your opinion, here's the question, is it worth trading the X-T2 and the X-100F for an X-Pro3? Oh, my word. Well, no, actually. Yeah, I'd say no also. Mm. Um purely because the X-T2 is is good enough. Just because the X-Pro3 is, is out doesn't mean that... the uh, Sorry, the X-T3 is out doesn't mean the X-T2 is not still very good. X-100F, I, I just couldn't... I couldn't... I couldn't do it. It'd be like giving up meat. <laughs> <laughs> I... I was thinking the other... I, when I went to the House of Photography for the for the launch um last week which which by the way is is an amazing place yeah, oh just, haven't been, you haven't been there yet I know, because I you were it. working that night I, I was doing a, launch. a nighttime street photography yeah. um, workshop yeah. in covent garden i know whilst everybody was in the house of photography you could, why couldn't you just have ended up there with the because the it didn't finish till 10 well yeah but you should have made that part of the visit or mm, something <laughs> maybe no it was uh it is, it's an extraordinary place and a real statement of intent i think from from fujifilm and i was um look i'm not an ambassador i was i was there in a professional capacity recording some stuff the other day for the instax crew but um i have to say i I'd felt i felt immeasurably proud to be involved in the brand um seeing that I, you know there's an incredible uh, david bowie exhibition in there at the moment as well yeah i saw that that's worth seeing um, yeah, they all got free copies of the book when they went on that opening <coughs> VIP night as well. Missed that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I've got one of those down here. Oh, you've got one as well. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, God, that's it. <laughs> right, and um, uh, he also has uh, one final little question. Uh, well, it's more of a point, really. Have you planned an episode on child family photography? And whilst we don't really plan things like that, no. we definitely... I, I think it's a good idea. I want to get Cara Mew on uh, one point, at some point, um, mm, plus uh, plenty of other people yeah. that we shall do. So Cara Mew is uh, definitely on the list for uh, an interview, if we can get hold of her in her busy schedule. Yes. Uh, if you don't know Cara Mew, go and check out her website, mm. and it is phenomenal. Um, the, the house of photography thing, the reason why I was mentioning it, by the way, is somebody uh, was talking about, would you swap the... 
Would you swap your X100 for an X Pro 3 with the opportunity, obviously, to uh, change lenses? Would you? Would I swap my well, the, X100F for an X Pro 3? X Pro 3. Because <sighs> then you have the advantage of the better sensor, better yeah, low light. Because yeah, the yeah. X100F, um, even though it's good, it's still not amazing yeah, in low light. Yeah, but it's. No, I don't know. This, it, you see, that's a little bit like asking, you know, swapping an apple for an orange. It's, you know. In the old days, I'd say that's a little bit like swapping a burger for a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I can't. It's not playing on your mind at all, this I, I, veganism, I, I is it? I'm struggling with that. Yeah. I, I, I just can't get rid of the X100F. <clears throat> yeah, right. I mean, the X-Pro3 technically is a better camera. And, of course, you could change lenses and all of the other stuff that goes with it. But the X100F is such a beautiful thing to use and enjoy to use yeah and, and i quite like that idea of being tethered to a focal point all, all my all my travel stuff now if i'm not taking pro cameras mm. well i think the x100f has a pro camera actually mm-hmm. but but i will take the x100f yeah i would as well and who knows what Fits happens in the, in the future well absolutely you know these sensors i heard something anyway moving on um hi neil hi kev i've just started a personal project this year which involves interviewing and for, uh, photographing uh, world war ii veterans in order to preserve some of their individual stories of their time in service so i'd like to get some advice from you both um firstly there's a bit, a bit of an image overload and the reason why because when stephanie wrote this um uh, stephanie baxter when she wrote this in she's still working at fuji love yeah, yeah i believe okay. so yeah so um, stephanie yeah yeah, so um, obviously I would imagine Stephanie sees a shed load of pictures mm. day in, day out. So mm. yes, I can imagine uh, why she says there's a bit of image overload in my life and I sometimes find myself creatively paralysed after seeing so many images on a regular basis. Trying to capture unique images is very hard when you feel like you're always absorbing others' approaches. Mm. There's also that age-old problem of comparison. I constantly find myself tearing my own photography down because I'm always seeing such high-quality work from other photographers that I admire so much and whom I consider to be so much better and more skilled uh, than myself. Any tips or advice on stopping myself from falling into these two traps would be greatly appreciated. I'm going to aim that one fairly at you. Uh, as it comes, cross the table. Uh, yeah, well, it's tough. Uh, it, you know, you, it would be totally unnatural if you didn't feel that way. I feel that way, you know, whenever I'm looking at other people's work. And, and you know, you have to you have to essentially just look past all of that stuff and just think, actually, I'm doing this for me or I'm doing it for my clients. And ultimately, you can't be, you, you know, you can't you can't drive the fastest car. You can't have the biggest house. You can't have the uh, most beautiful husband or wife whatever in the world although i have and uh wife not husband <laughs> and um you know it, you, you just can't it's unrealistic but it is uh, i quite liked what she said there about creativity overload that's yeah. that's a very Do you feel you have very, creativity overload yeah i think potentially you know and you I, I this last couple of weeks i've been editing a lot of weddings and when you're looking at your own work constantly yeah. And then you look at other people's works, and it's not necessarily just wedding photographers, but other stuff. And uh, you 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 end up just thinking, why am I not, uh, you know, creating these beautiful, beautiful uh, portraits or these beautiful, beautiful studies of landscapes and stuff? And then actually, you realise because this is what pays the bills, and this is what Mm. you know I'm, I'm reasonably good at. And you know, so this is this is what I'm doing, and it, it's a psychological thing. And you know, we live in a world of creativity, of pictures being thrown at us left, right, and centre. And you know, even in the car coming here, I, I, I had the the DAB radio on the car, and the you know the radio station comes up with pictures mm. now on the on the dashboard. You're supposed to look at uh, pictures while you're driving. Well, I'm not really, but they're there. You know, it's what? it's telling you. It's a little picture of the. Kids watching YouTube while he's the, driving. The, <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> it's a little picture of the um, the people on the record player oh, on the you know oh, on of course, the thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's icon. everywhere. Yeah, the little yeah. icon. It's just everywhere, and it's be be happy with what you do and uh, do what you're happy with. That's it is. It is. I mean, sometimes you. Yeah, I disappear down huge rabbit holes of imaging. Um, when I'm well, this morning with Keith Bernstein looking over his uh, his portfolio, I mm. found myself so I was all over the net. And it's not so much um, why can't I do this? It's for, for me, I find it in that why aren't I in that situation where I'm where I'm putting something back into the world like that? Yeah, that's what I find. Yeah, yeah, but that's because you've got an, a, you've got a benevolent soul inside of you, oh, and right. and many people have, many people don't. <laughs> I'm not talking about <laughs> politics today. <laughs> 
<laughs> We're not allowed. Public broadcast laws. Yeah. Oh, yes. No, you're not allowed to talk about anything to do with any politicians anywhere in the world. Don't be rude. And that includes you. Your question. <laughs> so I have a uh, another large question from uh, Nick Dyson. I have only recently started listening to the Futurecast and now I'm hooked. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much, Nick. My question is regarding street photography. I'm a hobbyist photographer. I'm still trying to find my style after trying my hand at landscape photography. I've recently become interested in street photography after following some great street photographers on Instagram, such as Valerie Jardin. Bonjour, this is Valerie Jardin. Alan Schaller. Alan, is that your best you can do? That's what she says. <laughs> Actually, we, we, uh, we have her on our list of um, people yes, we should interview at some point. Very too. much, yeah. Alan Schaller. I love Alan Schaller's work. Uh, Craig Whitehead. I love his work also. And then uh, and me also, he says. Um, my question is how to get started <laughs> in street photography. I like the way you... What did he say at the end of that sentence? And He said, and save the best till last. Kevin Mullins. Kevin Mullins. Yes. Look at that. And that make you feel better. Yeah. Uh, just, I'm just hungry. <laughs> <laughs> My question is how to get started in street photography. I'm a bit apprehensive about taking photos of random strangers in the street, especially after reading an article about a photographer who was beaten up and had his camera smashed oh, at Notting Hill yeah. Carnival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but I have... Uh, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a little asterisk next to that. Yeah. Uh, I currently shoot with an X100F, which is a pretty discreet, but I am a bit nervous about being spotted photographing someone. Also, I'm worried I'll fall into the trap of just taking snapshots instead of photos with an mm. interesting subject. Wow. Any advice you can give for a beginner starting out in street photography would be greatly appreciated. Kevin, will you be running any street photography workshops in the North England? Thanks, Nick Dyson from Huddersfield. Are you going to go to Hang on, we just had a Huddersfield question. Did we have a Huddersfield? Was that from Nick Dyson as well? No. Your previous question was from Huddersfield. Was it? Yeah. Um, no, that's Greg Smith of Huddersfield. Yeah, so we've had two <coughs> Huddersfields. That's all right. Yeah. Sometimes we get two New Yorks. Hmm. Two Huddersfield. Huddersfield, Huddersfield. So all right. good they named it twice. Okay, so, yes, absolutely. That First of all, the snapshot thing, uh, you will take snapshots. We all, oh. I take snapshots. Everybody takes snapshots. Um, but, you know, the, the things you see on the, when you see Valerie's work or Alan's work or Craig's work, uh, they're only showing you the pictures that they want to show you, of course. Uh, if you go out for a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, a month, a year, you may not have any pictures that you deem worthy of what you want. Um, you know, if you if you look at um, street photography uh, genres and a whole, it's totally subjective. And so, what you think is a snapshot might not be someone else's snapshot. And every single snapshot is a is a statement of history today, which will be a um, moment of of history in the future. Uh, so, people I've said it before: people on their mobile phones sat down eating a, a KFC yeah, or something yeah. else really tasty. Then you know it's, uh, it's well one day when people are just talking into their hands or something exactly. they'll look back and say what are those things people are talking exactly. into that's a mobile phone mobile phone granddad what were they exactly it becomes nostalgia right <clears throat> and we've, <clears throat> we've talked about um bob Mazer's images of the underground before well i was just about to mention bob's images because you could say some of those there's the particular one where the the couple are having a good old-fashioned snog yeah and they're, they're all sort of on the floor around you might say that's a snapshot but actually well at the time it would have been yeah because there's no real difference in, in the time people would look at that picture and think hmm, it's just two people on the tube but now when you look at that picture and mm. you see the telephone box in the background and you see all of the yellow pages hanging undisturbed un broken and unburnt and all that kind of stuff underneath the telephone with every single number of everybody who lived in London in uh, all of those things the the ghetto blaster and everything because we're looking at them now it becomes a nostalgia and a reminder of the past uh, but more importantly than a reminder of the past for the people of the past yeah. it becomes a uh, a lesson on the past for the people of the let future me, let me just grab something from the from the back of the room here hold on this is very relevant to what you're saying okay it's a, a, a black box with an album in it okay and this this is an album from my mum and dad's wedding okay but the first the first page here uh no second or third page here we go that's and that's granddad's shop and for me that that now that could be a that could be a documentary picture this one here can you see that yeah yeah, right? yeah 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 h.a stewart uh, next yeah. to Clifford Stores, in uh, just just off the Great Cambridge Road, the A10. Yeah, and we look. You look at the car. You look at the architecture. You look at the street signs. The- no, a, photo- a wedding photographer <laughs> taking that picture today yeah. would probably dismiss that, right? Because all of the people have their backs to you. Yeah, you can't see yeah, the bride yeah. and groom's yes, face. It's no. basically. Uh, a, 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 you know, the, the most important thing is the car, and perhaps that's why the photographer took it. But but other than that, it's a fairly cluttered scene with with you know with you can't see any faces. Mm. But now looking at it, it's got everything in it. 
you know, well, I it's, get, a, it's a period I, drama I, in I, itself. I get really excited looking at pictures like that, and yeah. uh, you know, it's it, so this idea of snapshots. Um, Take that away completely. Yeah. We've still got about six questions from Nick to, I, to, to answer. Uh, right, what was the more, other one? More questions on there. Hey, well, it was, uh, it was kind of a, uh, a little... Um, a, m- a multi-question. Yeah, a little conversation. Yeah, so okay. uh, the other thing was about the photographer who had his camera smashed at oh, Notting yes. Hill. Yes, yes, I don't yes, know if yes, you yes. remember this. I do, I do. And um, I don't know for sure, and I'm, it's only what I've kind of read. I believe that he came out of a coffee shop or something, took a picture of people in a in some kind of embrace, and th- then it all went kind of dramatically he got, wrong. He got featured, actually, on LBC, I think. Yeah, yeah, it all went dramatically wrong. Now, you you have to, of course, be very careful when you're taking those kinds of pictures, if those are the kinds of pictures you want to take. Joel Merowitz say you have to be balletic with the environment. You have to find the vibe. And if there's a if there's an element of um, of I shouldn't be taking this picture, then don't take it. And and also you have your you have to have your own uh, moral compass. And my moral compass is is you know I would never take a picture of anything that I would not be comfortable of a, some other stranger taking a picture of me. Right. In. And so by that nature, typically I find myself waiting in one place, looking for the light first, waiting in one place, uh, waiting for a long time in one place for something of interest to happen so i'm not chasing people i'm not chasing the shot i'm just waiting and watching and and observing which is the you know brings me on to the other thing about street photography it's mostly about observing Mm. and seeing and understanding where you are and yeah ultimately you know and he says my my ultimately the question is how to get started in street photography so nick right nick are you listening are you listening to me nick (laughs) pick up your x100f now yes got it you picked it up i think he has no, I can't hear him. Have you got oh. it? Oh, no, he's got it now. He's got it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just got it. He's got it. And go out of your front door. He's gone. No, it's a big house. Hold on. <laughs> right, now he's gone. Yeah, he's gone. And bring the camera to your eye and just take pictures of whatever is in front of your front door. Whatever oh, it is. Okay. Doesn't matter. Does well, not away matter. from the front door, or back towards the front door. No, away from the front door. Oh, well, I just wondered. Yeah. Although he does live in a very nice house with a really beautiful front door. <laughs> so, but no, away from. It's a little house. bit frightening that you feel that Kev can actually see you now, isn't it? And take those pictures. Take uh, take no more than five pictures. Right. Hang on, I'm waiting. He's, well, he's got it on burst. No, no, no. He won't have done that. <laughs> he's not. He's not that kind of person. Okay. Right. Got those pictures. Right now, go back into your lovely front door, along your big corridor. Download them. Yeah, download them, and then look at them. Right. No, you're a street photographer. Oh, there, there you go. We go. You're done. Well done. You're in. That's how you become a street photographer. And then you just get a little bit braver and move away. Um, but every, even those five pictures, if you don't look at them for another 50 years, in 50 years' time when you look at them, they will remind you of that time and they will become nostalgia. You're talking about moral compass. I mean, they're, they're, but then there are many different forms of uh, street work, aren't there? I mean, Bruce Gilden's moral compass is it's an entirely different kettle of fish, isn't it? Yeah. But I, I love his work. I'm, I'm absolutely um, you know, enamoured. And, and that is a rabbit hole I can really be drawn down. Yeah, uh, there's a, there's that amazing film on um, YouTube. I think it is where Bruce Gilden does. I think, funny enough, like, Bruce it, Gilden owns no, the street. I think it's Derby. So. He goes he goes to do street photography in, in Derby. Derby. Really? Yeah. What well, on YouTube? It's a BJP okay. um, film. It's it's quite a few years old, right, but okay. he, he goes off to do his New York thing in Derby, and uh, <laughs> this this little old lady kind of starts hassling him. Yeah. And uh, it's very very English. It's you basically you've taken this Bahamath American New Yorker. What does he say? to her she's I, I, is she tugging at his it, I, I can't coat tail, saying, i can't rem- pictures of me yeah it's some, i think she waves an umbrella at him or a handbag really? or something and uh yeah <laughs> you probably we, found that quite amusing didn't you yeah no it did it was it was very interesting to watch it and unravel they probably ended up as mates i will now i am curating the much more in-depth um, show notes page i will i will dig that one. out and yeah. i will link to it on our well, show notes i've never seen that one that would be great to see yes <laughs> and and on the uh, the note of uh, of of seeing you uh, out of the radio as it were um i always remember my my dad saying that to me he said uh, you know they can they can actually uh, see you you know be very careful what you're saying when uh, when <laughs> when the radio's on for from for, for a few years um I, I think he managed to persuade me that some the presenters can see out the other one. Oh, <laughs> I, I love, I love I, that. I remember I love saying that to Albie once when he was very young, 
he said uh, there was a black and white film on TV or something. He said, Dad, why is that in black and white? I said, oh, well, up until like the 50s, the world was in black and white. <laughs> That's why I used to he say that like, kids as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they, did he believe it? I said to him, there's still a place in Australia right near Alice Springs that's still black and white. <laughs> Just only in black and white. <laughs> it's not yet moved on. Right, uh, let's move to this week's interview. Um, we are, yes, talking to Keith Bernstein. And I, what an amazing privilege, actually, to talk on the same stage as, as him. Hmm. I assume that's what. Uh, did well, you it was, share a stage? No, 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 no. It was a. Uh, I think it was part cameras or something like that. They had okay. like a, a day of a day of talks. Yeah. And he was the he was the star attraction. Well, Keith Bernstein, film set photographer, a personal photographer to Nelson Mandela, a photojournalist who got closer to the actual Black Hawk Down story than he probably wanted to be. But before you hear all about that. A short plotted history of Keith's life to, to lead you into the interview. And there there will be a complete version over on the Breathe Pictures podcast coming out soon. Keith was born in South Africa, but when he was age seven, things dramatically changed. His mother and father had been involved in the struggle to end apartheid and were involved in the Ravonia trial, a trial that saw 13 defendants, including his father, and one Nelson Mandela. It was a, a trial that was to lead to the long sentence handed down to Mandela. Now, Keith's father wasn't in prison, but it was clear it was only a matter of time, so the family fled and they settled in the UK. Keith's mother was the resident artist in the family and introduced him to photography, and so after time spent in apprenticeship as an assistant to a famous portrait photographer called Mark Gerson, he left to seek his own luck and fortune, and so we leap to his first big paid job aged 18, photographing The Clash. 9th of May, 1977. The time punk was just beginning to take a real hold in music history. Not a bad job, and one I suggested probably felt like all his Christmases had come at once. All of them, for the rest of my life, they'd all come at once. So how, how did that come about? I saw an ad in the back of the BJ Feverich and the photography, and it was from David Redfern. Uh, David passed away a few years ago, but he was one of the first photographers in this country to photograph musicians live. The thing that he loved more than anything was jazz. He had a table at the front of the stage at Ronnie Scott's club. He used to go there three or four nights a week. And he loved photographing jazz. And he started a big library in his studio in Covent Garden. And it was just at the beginning of the punk era, so 1977. And he needed photographers to supply material for his library. There was no way that David was going to be seen dead at a punk concert. <laughs> uh, so I worked for him. The first week that I worked for him, I photographed The Clash, uh, in a famous concert that they had at the Rainbow Theatre where there were also the Buzzcocks and Sham 69. Oh, yeah. Two days later was an Elton John concert and two days after that was Chuck Berry. So if you say all my Christmases came at once, you're absolutely right. But it's bizarre because you also described that period. Once you'd left Mark Gerson's employment, that you do yeah. describe your departure from Estudio as a bit of a disaster. But it doesn't sound at all like a disaster to me. That This was all beginning to, to happen nice and swiftly for you. And maybe disaster's too strong, but when you look back, you kind of have more of a reflection and distance on it. And when you're young, you think that these things, these kind of breaks, such as photographing the clash in the first week of your employment, you're young and you think that these things are going to happen to you all the time. And you don't realize until you get older how kind of rare and infrequent and haphazard they are. And I think it was probably just the kind of arrogance and sort of impatience of youth that you kind of think, well, this. I can leave David Redfern and go and work on my own because everything will come my way because it's been relatively easy so far and you just don't realise how hard it is and how tricky it's going to be down the line. I think maybe the answer to this next question is going to be no. Um, did, did you have any kind of strategy? Did, did you know what you wanted your photography to be and, and what it was to become? Uh, no, you're right. The answer is no. I, all I knew was, I mean, I loved photography. I loved looking at pictures. I used to collect books much more than I do now. I used to go and see a lot of exhibitions, even when I was kind of young and more stupid than I am now. Um, I had no kind of master plan at all. And again, it was, a, a, I hate to kind of hark back to this, but it was a slightly different time in that there seemed more work. There were a lot of studios around, a lot of photographers around who employed people, and you didn't have the kind of slight insecurity that you maybe have 
now where the work is much harder and you know everyone's got a camera everyone's taking pictures we know all of those cliches it was just a very different period uh, your, your bio and the articles that um, that are on the the web about you they mm-hmm. leap somewhat really from the 70s to the early 90s which mm-hmm. we'll come to shortly but i'm intrigued to know what bridges this gap i, I know you you started to find photojournalism assignments yeah i mean i think that there have been sort of two or three incidents in my life that have been real kind of sliding doors moments and they probably will resonate with any anyone who's been freelance long enough that you might over time develop a career plan and an idea of what you want to do, but it's the haphazard things that you can never predict that really have a big influence. So I knew a filmmaker who was doing a documentary in Southern Africa, and I was sort of freelancing without much success, trying to do some work for Time Out and local newspapers and so on without much success. And she said she was doing this documentary, and it was in the early days of Channel 4, when they had quite a lot of money, and they wanted a stills photographer, and would I go along? And of course, the obvious answer to that is yes, and yes, that started. Yeah. Uh, so that was a trip to Southern Africa, Angola, Mozambique, and South Africa. And the pictures from that then got me freelance work with the Sunday Telegraph newspaper, and that's how that kind of kick-started the sort of photojournalism period. Isn't it funny how your, your history kept sort of drawing you back to the African continent? Yeah, completely. You can't leave it, uh, you can't leave it alone. And I was listening to one other of your um, podcasts for a photographer who grew up in South Africa who's now based in the UK. And he said the same thing, that there's something about it that draws you back. Maybe it's the same thing for anybody who was born in one country and moves to another, but certainly Africa did, did kind of keep drawing me back. Well, on, on the African front then, 1993, you find yourself in Mogadishu uh, during several fateful days in October. D- dates popularised, of course, by the film Black Hawk Down, but mm-hmm. this, this was no movie event. This was a, a fearful city to be in at that time. What are your memories of it? Well, the story of those pictures which are on my website it kind of encompasses all the schizophrenia of being a freelance photographer. So I'd been to Somalia twice before, months before I took the pictures for Black Hawk Down, uh, both time on trips organized by MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier, uh, and both times I'd absolutely hated it. The people were really aggressive. The country was extremely dangerous. Uh, I didn't find it kind of rewarding in any sense at all, and the pictures that I'd taken didn't have any kind of impact. So after the second time I came back, I swore that I would never go back to Somalia again. And then the phone rang one afternoon, and it was the then picture editor of The Observer, Tony McGrath, saying that he had a journalist going back to Mogadishu, and would I go? So all the schizophrenia of being a freelancer, my immediate answer was yes, when does, you know, I'll be on the next plane, when do you want me to go? Uh, And the story behind that was that Somalia had entered a period of peace after a real sort of civil war and upheaval. And he, Tony McGraw, wanted to do a story for the Observer on how the services were opening, the markets and street markets and the hospitals were getting back to normal, how life was returning to normal in Somalia. And on the afternoon that we arrived, myself and the journalist Mark Huban, that was the, at that afternoon, that evening, the Americans launched the mission to try and capture General Idid, who was one of the Somali warlords. And that's how those sort of 72 hours unfolded. And where were you during that period? How close did you get to that? Uh, There was only one hotel in Mogadishu, and we were uh, collected from the airport and put up by an aid agency who would house journalists whenever journalists arrived. And we could hear the firing going on a few kilometres away. We didn't know what was happening, but in the early evening, a group of Somalis came to the house. It was a Save the Children house. They came to the house because they knew that there were often journalists there. And they said that there was this big attack taking place and they wanted to take us and show us what was there. And we talked about it and we didn't go to the area where the helicopters had crashed. They took us instead to one of the local polyclinics, which is a very small kind of makeshift hospital. And that's some of the pictures that you can see on the website. Mm. And that's where they were bringing in hundreds and hundreds of casualties and carrying them in in wheelbarrows or on planks of wood or just dragging them in. It was an extraordinary period, wasn't it? And I, I watched uh, a film recently of one of the uh, one of the rangers whose job it was to go back in and rescue the uh, the troops that were aboard one of the downed um, helicopters. Yeah. And uh, he went, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the particular market there, but e- even now he says it's an extremely dangerous place to go through. Yeah, it's a, it's really a lawless place. It's really a lawless place. And uh, after we'd been to the hospital, we went back to the house and then early the next morning, the Somalis came back to the house and said they wanted to take us to the market square, which is where the helicopters had been shot down. Uh, and that's where the scene of the 
airmen who they'd captured, who were obviously dead, were being dragged through the streets. And those are the pictures that you know you see on the website and that were seen all around the world at that time. In happier circumstances, what a difference a year can make. In 1994, you find yourself as the de facto private photographer with, a, with as much freedom around the great man as you want, photographing Nelson Mandela in the run-up to the presidential election but I, I, I don't want to I don't want to assume but I'm, I'm guessing there, there must have been an enormous trust between he and you with the family connection uh, it was it was less him although there was obviously a connection there although my dad was pretty elderly by this time and had left any kind of connection with South Africa um, it was less him but it was more about the people that surrounded him and again it's like looking through the wrong end of a telescope when you look at that period so 94. I went to South Africa and actually was sharing an apartment with Tom Stoddart. We were there for three months together. Right. And just by virtue of being there every day, you got incredible access to him in a way that would just be absolutely unthinkable now. It's a completely different era. There was no real accreditation. His press officers and security would get to know you very quickly and would just let you in and give you the most amazing access to him. So it was less to do with Mandela himself, although I think the tone of his whole approach is obviously set by him. But it was just a very different period. There was there was no almost no security. There were no restrictions on what you could and couldn't do. And it's it's just like looking back on something that doesn't exist anymore. He seemed so in the photographs I see of you of yours of him and and in the rooms where he is. He seems so at ease with the fact that you're there. Yeah, I think. Well, I I think again, I'm not trying to sort of be modest about it. I don't think it's to do with me. I just, you know, it was, he was the first democratically elected president. He had a lot of other things on his mind. And I think that if you stayed unobtrusive and didn't try to set anything up, that you could uh, be with him and accompany him. And some of the pictures are obviously at his official residence, Hanardendal, which is the presidential residence in Cape Town, in his living room upstairs. And there, there was no kind of connection, really. He just had so much else to do that as long as you weren't in the way, you were the least of his kind of concerns and problems at that time. What were your family's thoughts about that return to South Africa, the, the change in the country's plight, maybe, and what, what you were doing? Well, both my parents have passed away now, but I never really talked to them about it. I think that they took pride in what I did and in the work that I did, but they never particularly spoke to me about the Mandela stuff. There was one story which I did, which was at a nudist camp in Michigan, which seemed to have much more of an impact and interest to them than the work that I did with Mandela. (laughs) Oh, the irony. What do you remember most about uh, Nelson Mandela? I think the thing that has kind of stayed with me, and again, it's more in hindsight that because I photographed so many other politicians, British and foreign, over the years, and the thing he could do things that no other politician could do. And he could do things with people that he met and encountered that I've never seen anybody else able to carry off. He just had an ease about him and an approachability. And there was one incident with Mandela that I remember we'd gone to uh, Soweto and he was going to give a speech to some students there. And there was a football team, 11, 12 year old football team. And Mandela was wearing his suit and he had his bodyguards with him and the press were there. And as, uh, just before he started his speech, one of the members of the captain of the football team came up on stage and gave him the Soweto football shirt, the football shirt of the team with that Mandela on the back. And he didn't miss a beat. He didn't take off his jacket. He just pulled the shirt on over his jacket and tie. And he gave the whole speech to the dignitaries and the football people wearing this football shirt. It was something that if any other politician had done it, it would have just gone kind of disastrously wrong and would have looked like a terrible stunt. But to him, it was just so easy. We're going to come back, actually, to Nelson Mandela in in, in a short while when talking about films. I'm intrigued to to the stills uh, working on on film sets and the still side of your work, because because that that was a a complete departure from from politics and... uh, and photographing punk bands and all the other things you've done, mm-hmm. suddenly you find yourself in the, in the world of um, hot lamps and Hollywood. Yeah, you make it sound very quick, but it was, a, it was a slower journey than that. So the photojournalism work began to decline, particularly as magazine and newspaper budgets began to be cut. Uh, that was one of the influences. And the other one was the attack on the Twin Towers. And I think that very shortly after that, one of the minor consequences of it was that access to a lot of institutions like prisons, government institutions and so on became a lot harder. Mm. And my work certainly began to decline and I was kind of lost for a while as to what I was going to do. I was obviously wasn't trained for anything else, didn't want to do anything else. And again, it's one of those kind of odd things that happens if you're freelance for long enough. I had a 
call out of the blue one day from a friend of mine who's a publicist for films. Uh, and she was referencing the work that I'd done in Southern Africa. She said that she was starting to work on a new project with a British director, and she thought I should come and meet him in South Africa and just show him some of the pictures that I'd taken. And the director was Anthony Minghella. Uh, and the film was the number uh, first adaptation of the number one ladies detective agency. Not a bad way to start. It's a fantastic <laughs> way to start. And it, in a way, it kind of spoiled me because Anthony, as I said, was the director. Uh, the DP was Seamus McGarvey, who I've subsequently worked with. And both of those are absolutely fantastic people, both in the way that they are on set and in the quality of the work that they do. And I, that was the first film that I worked on. And I thought, well, from now on, every... DP, every director is going to be the same as these two. And it's a. Yeah, they weren't. <laughs> just like learning curve. Yeah, but it was a good way to start. What's the essential role of a, a stills photographer on, on set? If you say to people that you're a landscape or wedding or fashion photographer, they think they have a good idea of what you do. If you say you do film stills, they generally have no idea. So you're there on film and TV productions. Uh, you're part of the camera department and you're there to provide all the stills material that they're going to need to publicize the film in any format. And traditionally, that would have been the poster and maybe reviews in newspapers and magazines. Yeah. That still applies. But obviously now, of course, there's a huge demand on social media. So Twitter and Facebook, Instagram accounts use the pictures a lot. And there are also a, a huge amount of material that the general public don't get to see because it's not released, but they form part of the archive that the film company and sometimes the particular directors want to have. You mentioned Twitter and, and social media. How has that proliferation of, of media than, and if you like, the free exchange of images affected how you can make a living from this? Uh, it's made an impact in that they use more pictures than they ever used before. Traditionally, a kind of a, a press kit. So a film studio might release a press kit, which might be 20 to 25 approved photographs, film stills, and they would go out to the magazines and newspapers. That still exists. Um, but in addition to that, obviously, they're using a lot of social media stuff. It's hasn't impacted me directly in the work that I do because that side of it is handled entirely by the publicity department of the studio that's distributing the film. So that's slightly out of my hands. Right. So yeah, I don't, I don't think that that's kind of impacted the sort of the amount of work that I, I get or the amount of work that I need to do. I would imagine that the directors uh, form a good bond of trust with the stills photographer. I mean, I know you've worked with Clint Eastwood in a variety mm -hmm. of, five or six times, haven't you? Five or six projects. Seven times, yeah. Seven times, seven yeah. times. <laughs> do, do they call for you individually? Did you find that that's what it became, that people would say, look, we trust Keith, we want Keith? Uh, it varies. I mean, there are people that I've worked so Clint Eastwood seven times. Um, there are certain actors who have particular requests. I've worked with Idris Elba three times. And certain producers that I go back to or studios, so HBO, for example, and Warner Brothers will go back. Um, but there are, I mean, there's so much production being done now, particularly at a very high level of TV, um, that the demand has become almost kind of insatiable. But there are some people, as you say, who a big thing is that they want to trust you on set because there can't be any mistakes and you can't upset the actors because the time is so crucial and they're under so much pressure. And as long as they've got a kind of insurance of trust that you're not going to be in the way and you're not going to disturb anybody and you're going to deliver what they need in terms of the publicity, then yeah, they'll stick with you. But I would imagine that that's not particularly different from working for a particular ad agency. I'm pleased you mentioned Idris Elba actually in, in Long Walk to Freedom and that, that mm. movie you worked on because there was one particular moment where reality and movie world collide where you, you photographed the two of them at totally different times in history. But there was a mirroring moment, the famous hand on cheek shot. Yeah, it's one of those things that when it happens to you, you're your mind kind of connects two things that happened nearly 10 years apart. So in 96, Mandela, as president, came to England on a state visit. I accompanied him and he did all, it was a three-day visit. He did all the things that presidents do. He met the Queen and went to Downing Street and so on. And his final engagement, he was an old man by now, his final engagement on that visit was a press conference in the basement of South Africa House. Uh, and I took a picture of him there, which is a, a really ordinary nondescript picture. It's a headshot of him resting his head on his hand. It's the kind of press conference picture that thousands of people have taken. And it was never published because there was nothing exceptional about it. And I put it away in a box. I mean, the negatives went away in a box in the back of my office for about 10 years. And then we were shooting Long Walk to Freedom in South Africa. And there was a reenactment Idris Elba had to do a reenactment of a really famous speech that Mandela gave just before the election on live TV and we'd had all kinds of problems on that day with the filming. So what should have been a fairly easy scene to do had taken 
many hours to create because of some technical problems. And just before we started doing the take, Idris, who's an extremely patient and quiet actor, took exactly the same pose that Mandela had mm. taken 10 years before in South Africa House. And I took the same picture, albeit in colour. What was his reaction? Uh, he was just slightly stunned. I put the two pictures side by side on an iPad and showed them to him. And uh, he didn't say very much, but I, I think he was just... I think he was probably moved that he, because one of the things he was worried about, particularly with a big South African crew as we had, was trying to sort of successfully capture the spirit and the mood of Mandela. And, you know, whatever reservations people have about the film, I think he did that really I, I, successfully. I, I would agree with you. Across the years then, how has your work changed? I'm, I'm not really referring to, to kit or digital, though. That must have made a difference. Your, your, yeah. your enthusiasm hasn't changed. I've, I've gone at that. But what about your work, your style, your, your photographic voice? I don't think it's changed very much. I mean, I'm still, you know, I'm still looking at the same photographers that I looked at when I was kind of 15, 16, 17. I mean, along with other new ones, but I still go back to the same ones that I looked at. I, I don't think anything has changed. I mean, I still love, it's one of those kind of cliches that you see on those terrible posters in offices about, you know, the worst day on a job that you love is better than the best day on a job that you hate, all that sort of nonsense. But I, I feel that, so... Uh, I, I'm really just kind of thrilled that I am a photographer, that in this period I'm able to make a living at it. But when that stops, when people don't pay me for it anymore, I, I'll still take pictures. It won't make any difference. Who is it that you, you still look at? Uh, well, uh, Larry Burroughs. I uh, look at his work a lot and have done that ever since I was a kind of mm, teenager, a little bit past teenager. Um, the one photographer, weirdly, that I, who's... I've got all of the books that are done about him and whose work I look at regularly every few months is Guy Bourdain. Yes. And I say weirdly because there's absolutely no connection between what I do and what he did. Um, and I'm not even sure that if he was a working photographer now, how he would be received in the kind of moral climate that we've got now. But I really look at his work a lot and... Yeah, study it, even though I know every one of his pictures backwards. Isn't it? I, I don't want to embarrass you, or, and I would imagine you're too modest to answer this question, but uh, now, of course, you'll find with your 45-plus uh, years of experience of being a photographer, yeah. now you're the one that inspires others. Yeah, that's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> well, I don't think it does, and I, I kind of hesitated to bring up Guy Bourdain's name because that's the implication of me doing that is that I see some kind of connection between what he did and the work that I do and I don't see any connection there at all so I would say to people that there are a lot better and more powerful photographers that they could look at for inspiration than me. What's next then? Uh, well I'm, I've started on I mean what's going to be the longest single job that I've ever had which is a series for HBO and we started a few months ago and we're now having a break coming up to Christmas and okay. um, we start again in January and that will take me through from January until June on one project are we allowed to know what that project is or is it all hushed and cloaked in secrecy I wish I could tell you but I've signed an NDA and I can't <laughs> say anything else I knew you were going to say that I knew that we'll you might find it if you dig around a lot but I don't know but <laughs> I can't say anything about it at this stage <laughs> and that's one of the kind of features of doing film stills is that you work on stuff that often you don't see the results of or say anything about for maybe a year two years down the line you reminded me of the great film movie line what's the first rule about fight club <laughs> exactly don't talk about <laughs> don't talk about the photography yeah, absolutely i know i've said this a, a few times of late um, but uh, there's going to be a, a fuller version of of that interview uh, on breathe pictures the podcast if you if you would like to Tune across to that, as they say, in old-fashioned lingo, um, and you, you can hear the, the longer version of Keith Bernstein soon, not quite yet. Although, if you're listening to this podcast in a year, <laughs> it'll be there. It'll be there. Right, okay, it's so difficult doing the time travel thing in podcast world, isn't it? Um, questions, back to your questions. Kev, go on, you, you've got a blinder to start with. I have a you? nice question, actually, a very intriguing kind of question from... Uh, ooh, she's from... Oh, might even be a he, Slovakia. So I'm almost definitely. Should, should my hand to be hovering on the get this name right? Possibly. Okay. Mary, I definitely got that bit right. Yeah, yeah. Morox. No. Morox. <laughs> it could be a silent, could be one of those useless silent letters that shouldn't exist. No, you can't say that about other people's point, languages. Silent, lang silent letters are pointless. <laughs> Morox. Well, it says the man who hails from Wales. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> they, they, all the letters are pronounced there. That's true. Yeah. Um, way too many of them. Morocco. Oh, okay, Morocco. It's spelled M O R O C Z. Oh, well, you got that right. 
There we go. Okay. Move on. Hi, Kevin and Neil. Love the podcast. After discovering it, I binge listened to it in two days. Two whole oh, questions. Wow. Okay. Uh, so, two questions. I am a beginner in wedding photography with the immense experience of a single wedding under my belt. And that's where we all started. And a few more where I crashed the wedding procession and used it as a practice running street <laughs> photography. <laughs> oh. Brilliant. Uh, looking at my images, it is clear that I'm really drawn to the quiet, still moments. I am an introvert for sure, but have no problem becoming an extrovert for the roles where it is needed. Now, now, how do I approach wedding photography where the action, i.e. the emotion, is the main actor? Can this be learned? Hmm. That's a really good question. This is all about, this is very much about learning your, um, or reading uh, an event, isn't it, really? Knowing what's going to happen next and reading the wedding yeah. before you? I think so, yeah. Learning how to be ahead of the game. Yeah, but also I think it's a, uh, a kind of conversation about allowing the wedding to happen naturally and photographing what is happening, you know, authentically and sympathetically. And if you start getting into the, you know, there's a, a little bit of a kind of caveat where uh, he or she, I'm very sorry, Mary, says, um, you know, I can become an extrovert for the roles where it is needed. So if at some point during the wedding, you then suddenly become the guider and, the, you know, right, come over here, do this, stand there, yeah. jump up in the air. The ringmaster, as the, I call it. Yeah, yeah, the ringmaster. Then essentially, that's what people are going to start expecting from you throughout the rest of the day. And, and you will, you know, you can't just fade into the background again at that point. Can you learn it? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's much to learn, really. I think it's just about allowing it to happen in front of you uh, and yes of course being able to predict and and prepare for uh, what's going to happen essentially but but allowing it to happen but the more you do the more more that becomes a skill anyway or an understanding mm -hmm. of the actual event you're at because mm -hmm. you you know where things happen you know how people emotively tend to react to certain situations. I mm. think when you go to one for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth time, you still you're not really attuned to it, are you? And that and that's why when people say, "Oh, the, the in, in, in fact, let's um, pre-promote next week's is wedding photography dead." Um, episode um, where, where people will say we well, don't need a pro anymore because actually the cameras are so good but that doesn't take account at all of of knowing your subject does it no absolutely and the personalities of the people there the amount of people that are there the mm. color the colors the environment the weather uh, you know that all of that stuff and you know I, again we've talked about this uh, many times but who why what where when that's yeah. that's what you want to be thinking about who why what where when and once you're doing if you can do that without any interaction then you're you know you're you're doing what you should be doing as a documentary style photographer uh, absolutely no um, you know no problems with being a bit of both or you know entirely mostly classical and then a bit of documentary whatever it doesn't matter but for the moments where you want to be a, a documentary photographer then you know you you have to have to rein in the uh, the can you look at if you look at me and smart just pretend you're laughing just mm -hmm. pretend you're laughing uh, nobody ever says that to me by the way <laughs> <laughs> we've got a question about that in a moment uh, and the second part of his question was um, oh, can I just ask quickly before you ask the second part how do long do you think it took you before you you feel that you had that um uh that knowledge of of subject that you you felt comfortable in in your shoes uh, i don't think i am really? i honestly i don't think even after hundreds of weddings I don't think so no really? i think you always kind of you always find different things different personalities and i mean i'm comfortable now in that i you know i can kind of hold my own ground and deal with pretty much any lighting condition and any yeah. Any bride of the mum or bride of the dad or you know or you know uh, uh, the um, what do you mean dad the, of the bride the or? dad of the bride whatever it is <laughs> all of those things you know what you meant um, <laughs> yeah so I'm comfortable in that and I, I'm pretty good at understanding pretty early who how the personalities are and who yeah. the who the the kind of interactive people are and the less interactive people you know all of that kind of stuff and that, again it comes it's a bit like the street photography question it comes down to observation true. it's yeah. And I'm just thinking, actually, with your your newfound veganism, um, you, when it when it comes to meal time now at weddings, you know, usually it's a nice slab of really, with a big, big you know, thick gravy, mm. doused with butter usually, and you're mm. you're gonna have the nut roast from now on, aren't you? Mm. Well, if it's a vegan nut roast, that's the problem with being a vegan. Like half the things you said, <laughs> there's a very big difference between vegetarian and vegan. Mm. Vegetarian. Are you a vegan or a vegetarian? Uh, te you're technically a vegan. Okay, okay. Yeah, or try and I'm a practice one. Yeah. You know, okay. vegetarianism is is kind of some nice food. Veganism is <laughs> no nice food. Uh, meat eating is nice food. 
<laughs> How long do you think he'll be on it, everybody? <laughs> really? Uh, part two of his question is, yes, why two. is the wedding photography of Mel de Giacomo so incredibly oh, intriguing? Yes. Uh, it is. We've talked about Mel uh, many times before, and I will, of course. Link- we still can't say his name properly. Mel- well, actually, interestingly, he or she, Mary, calls him Melchua, M-E-L-C-H-I-O-R. Ah. Di Giacomo. Di Giacomo is definitely the correct surname. Uh, I've just always called him Mel Di Giacomo. But however, I will link to his stuff again. And um, he is a really, but you know, his his main photography was tennis. His a lot of the iconic tennis. I did not know that photos of the eighties and seventies were his. Okay. Um, So there we go. Thank you, Mary uh, Morox. Um, from Alex Jones. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Neil. Uh, love the podcast. Yadda, yadda, yadda. As a man with a self-proclaimed monthly smile, quoted Kevin, do you ever find yourself running out of smiles far too early in the month? Like this is going somewhere, by the way. <laughs> like the first week after payday. You have all these smiles. Get payday? Over ex- What's yeah. payday? <laughs> <laughs> get overexcited and start dishing them out left, right and centre. And before you know it, you've got one smile left for the next three weeks and you need to decide who will get it, your son or your wife <laughs> or the new client that's uh, meeting before you. Um, I'm on the cusp of starting my my photography business. Goal is to have at least one client by the end of the year. However, I go through periods where I feel like I've run out of smiles. If you're there already and you're looking for your first gig... Um, uh, Sorry, Alex. Um, I can barely look at the camera, let alone pick it up, because I don't think my images will will turn out well off-face talking to people with enough enthusiasm to make them feel comfortable enough to work with me, which would really suck if my mortgage depended on it. Do either of you have any experiences like this? If you do, do you have any advice for talking, working with clients and getting stuff done when you're fresh out of smiles? (laughs) Keep keep casting those pods, please, from Alex. Brilliant. There is a serious side to that. (laughs) Yeah, there is. Well written, by the way, Alex. I love love it when people spend time creatively writing. Yeah, no... Um... Well, I, I have a pocket full of fake smiles as well that I do use you, in reserve. You stick them on your face, yeah, just like those things they have in those uh, those those <laughs> evening photo booths. <laughs> oh, you know, it's the thing is, it's the, you know, it's the rest. It's my resting face. That's the thing. Gemma's like, smile more. I'm like, yeah. this is my. I, you know, why would I smile when I'm boiling the kettle? Why would I grin at the kettle? Well, some people can do that. Yeah, but why? Why would you? It's why would you do it? There's nothing. It's just happy your, thoughts. Yeah, but my happy thoughts, thoughts. I love the coffee that's coming up. Yeah, okay. My my happy thoughts manifest themselves in my resting face, <laughs> which is resting. It's your action face. Um, but no, you do. I mean, in fairness, you do have to. Uh, you know, for the meetings and everything, you have to. Um, you have to use up some of your smiles for sure. Um, I have to say, I typically don't have meetings before weddings. Do you not? No, never. Well, so, not because you're worried about very, using up the smiles very infrequently. But part, but that's possibly part of what's mm. going on there. Uh, yeah, so... Um, I think you almost have to have a showbiz um, way about you. And I'm not talking about being the ringmaster, as we were discussing just now at weddings. I'm talking about, you know, I remember it from my radio days, that you would get up sometimes in the morning and, and life wasn't amazing that particular day. You'd had an argument the day before, or you, you're thinking, oh, I've got the credit card bill to pay, but I've not brought in enough this month. But then, then somebody says, right, red light on, be funny. Yeah, I often think about that actually when I'm listening to radio. You know, you must think sometimes they must have had a crappy old day <laughs> and they're just being totally normal. I used yeah. to work a long time ago, I worked at Microsoft and we were trained. We had this, this voice person came in and she was like, This is how you have to answer the phone. And oh. so this is how, this is how oh, no. I started, right? <laughs> Hello, you're through to Microsoft Customer Support. This is Kevin Mullins. How can I help you with that's your Visual cool. Basic problem today? Oh, my God, that's a long... Yeah. Um, and then just before I left, yeah. what was <laughs> I that? would answer the phone by going, Microsoft. <laughs> is that it? Yeah. Microsoft. Pretty much. Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't believe they have whole people that tra- the, the whole teams that train oh, you. Oh, it was that, really like, serious. Yeah. yeah, it was really serious. And, I'm not um, sure that I could, uh, I could sit with a straight face for a meeting like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was challenging. So um, yeah, I think so I you just you have to develop your showbiz game. I'm afraid on that one, and uh, so, you, know, like, you know, sometimes you just have to. It's a bit like when you have you have you, you must have shot a wedding when you when you've got really bad flu or a cold or something like that. Oh, what does I can and then you kind of raise your game, don't you, accordingly? And you get home and you download the images and you think. Well, actually, I, I think they're better than the last one I did when I was feeling fit as a fiddle. Mm, yeah. Funny, raising your game. Yeah. Raising your game. But I do, I mean, I, I kind of, uh, it's interesting really at weddings because I, speaking about that last wedding I shot 
previously and i said they did uh, cotton eye joe uh they were the, the the groom and the best man were both wedding photographers yeah. and uh very good ones also and they on. they said um at the end of it he he said uh you know we just we just didn't see you and some of our friends were like said you were, you were like a ninja just kind of disappearing and appearing and everything but i did have a massive black eye mind uh, and <laughs> he looked like a ninja <laughs> and i think the more you kind of keep yourself to yourself and do yeah. the thing you're meant to be doing the less likely you are to have to smile yeah <laughs> i do know that is funny because um you can spend hours can't you in documentary mode actually not talking to anybody yeah so i i guess right. yeah sooner or later somebody <laughs> might say cheer up mate might never happen yeah oh i've had that many times <laughs> have you yeah all right your yeah. question okay i have a good question from paul g from uh, york and he says hi neil and kevin I have an X Pro 3 question. Bet you haven't had any of those yet. <laughs> By the way, I have also left this question on Neil's video about the camera, but I'm uh, hedging my bets. Yeah, I'm yet to do my follow up on that. Mm. I do apologize. I'm really yeah. interested to know more about the focus limiting capability. Can yes. this work like a snap focus on the Ricoh GR cameras? Is it configurable to move it to different focal lengths? Uh, is there a notable improvement in autofocus acquisition when limiting between two focal lengths? Uh, it sounds interesting from a street photography point of view for zone focus or hyperfocal distance. What has been your experience? Oh, and is it coming to the X-T3? Yeah. Okay, you answer that then. <laughs> well, yes, it is. I found out the other day. And I can also tell you about two new cameras. No, I can't. <laughs> No. Um, so the thing about the X-T3... I'd I, be making it up. <laughs> no, I have no idea, absolutely no idea, and, and that's genuinely honest. And um, uh, yes, the, so the, the um, for those of you that don't know, there is this kind of focus limiter now on the uh, X-Pro3, which allows you to set uh, two parameters. For is it effective? Does it... Minimum and you, maximum. You've... I have tried it, yeah. yeah. Uh, it t- takes a little bit of getting used to, but yeah. I think those who use things like the Ricoh GR with the, ah. the snap focus will, will yeah, find it quite useful. That, yeah. Yeah. So essentially, when you, you press your autofocus, the camera is going to go up to you know f2.8 to 3.5, whichever you've set in the parameters. And you can set the parameters, and there are some kind of standard defaults, but you can set the parameters i think you can set three different ones as well so do you, you know what they are switch them on. well no no you can set them yourself oh so, can you all oh, yeah. right okay they're not not, um, not pre-selected by no 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 right. so there's some default pre-selected oh, okay. you can then set them yourself so uh yeah it does work um but it's you're effectively throwing yourself into um a kind of semi-automatic zone focusing if you like mm. and uh which is great and you know if you can if you can zone focus if you can work with zone focusing comfortably then you'll you'll find the snap focus you know really useful i think uh peter johnson hi neil hi kevin uh so i traded all my fuji kit now i've got a canon eos r have i made the wrong choice and will i be stopped from listening to the fuji cast absolutely yes <sighs> you are dead to me no no <laughs> come back come back no i think uh it, you know, it'd be a really really rubbish world if we all, if we all did the same thing and not absolutely. And not so much did the same thing but if we all I, yeah, those people uh, just because i've got this i use this that means i'm right and you must be wrong yeah I hate all that stuff. So no, I you know the the the, the um what does he call it the Canon R e- e- not the e- Nikon e- the Sar. Canon Canon yeah. ESR looks great. You know our, our friend Sanjay gets absolutely phenomenal images from it. Seen some of his images um, yeah, on, from from the ESR. And the thing. I mean, obviously you wouldn't want a memory card to fail, of course. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> uh, but no, in seriousness, it's it's great that there's um, and also competition breeds. Uh, creativity from the manufacturers so it's good it's all good everything's good two things here there were, there were two very short emails but we go, go back to, to a question from you Morris Webster said truly great listen for those of you old enough to get the references for me you two evoke the comedy of Derek and Clive do you remember Derek and Clive? Oh. with marginally less swearing <laughs> yeah I was going to say <laughs> I do remember Derek and Clive yeah did Derek and Clive actually bleep out there because you oh, know. I had a tape I had one of their tapes well when we say <laughs> We actually bleep it out. Uh, f- up, do we? Why? <laughs> Why do you get you get a clown horn and I get a? <laughs> see? Uh, Derek and Clive. Derek and Clive. Yeah, and the and the education um, in, information of Alistair Cook's letter from America. I don't think so. Mm. Uh, that now that's highbrow. Uh, Alistair Cook's letter from America, with a bit of photography stuff thrown in here and there. I don't think I don't think Alistair Cook ever did photography stuff, did he? No. I don't think Derek and Clive did either. I'm very good at highbrows, though. <laughs> you do have a couple of good highbrows. Sorry, back to you. I'm a batted bat. Okay, 15, so uh, this is from um, oh, from Brazil, right? Fernando was- dos Anjos. Oh, look at that. Yes. Straight away. See, I'm all right with the yes. Spanish dialect. Yes. And I don't appreciate it's Portuguese, but that kind of uh, Latin-y type sound and yeah. stuff. 
Hello, Kevin and Neil. I'm starting as a portrait photographer. I currently have an XT20, 35mm 1.4 and 50 f2. I'm thinking on upgrading the body and I would like to know if there is uh, too much difference between the XT2 and XT3. I know the XT3 is a better camera, um, but the image quality is really, is it really that difference? And so the XT2 is in a great price now, so I could get a used XT2 and a 56 1.2 for almost the same price as a new XT3. Okay, so um, you would not believe how many emails I get on Instagram, especially messages uh, on, on things like this. And uh, the answer ultimately is yes. It, because it's a newer camera with a newer number on the end of it, it will be a better camera and you, the image quality will be better. Um, how much better is is totally subjective. Um, you know, from a technical point of view, it's better at noise um, compression. It's got a bigger sensor. You know, it's all of that stuff. Do you get from your XT2 what you get from that you need? If you get what you from your XT2 what you need, keep it. Don't keep chasing the the gear. You know, that's that's ultimately it. So before uh, we uh, we end for this week, um, Ben Gillett, uh, conversation starter, um, introduced something to the Facebook group. If you are not a member of the FujiCast Facebook group, it's a private group, but that uh, we, we let anybody in. We let Ben in, for example. Look, he's a <laughs> viewer challenge, he said. Pictures first. Click on the image below and click again to reveal the story. I stress the challenge is much like not to chew a fruit past or to, to view all the images slowly allowing you to digest the story as it unfolds. Only then, if you're inclined, use the menu to reveal more or click the info button under each uh, particular image. All, all the images by uh, Nance. Now, we're going to give you a link for this. Nan Nance, oh, no, we can't actually give you a link to an individual post, can we? No, we can't. No, no, not no. to the Facebook post, but I will link to the, to the to uh, website. Boring, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, do, you, do you want to explain what the story was? Well, the, the story essentially is um, two people who were unwell and uh, husband and wife and uh, Nancy Borrow uh, the photographer photographed mm. their um, their struggles and their final final. Their husband and wife, aren't they? I they? presume so. Yeah, actually, I, so. I don't know. There's no words with it. At, at no. least uh, that I saw. But the images are. But they're both. They're, they're both look like they. Um, uh, they're obviously terminally ill. Yeah. But they're both going through this challenge together. Uh, uh, absolutely. It's you can't put words to it. It's no. and not only is the story in the pictures immense and very very powerful but the photography is beautiful. Mm. Uh, it's not just pictures of of you know of what is essentially a very sad story. Um, they are well executed pictures, beautiful editing, beautiful composition, beautiful uh, work with natural light. It, it, it's just all beautiful. Well, some of it's very, very simple. I mean, there's a picture of a um, of just a post-it note stuck on a wall that just says "I love you," mm. and and the, the simplicity of this work is. Uh, and there's a lot of humour in there as well. There's a lot of humour when she's she's got the fake hair on her head. It, and it, it, they're messing about in the in the kitchen. It feels to me it's very Elliot Erwitt esque. Uh, I feel yeah. it's just uh, it's it's incredible and absolutely if uh, it, it's a hard look okay we you know we have to tell you that it's it's Tricky a one, it's yeah. a powerful yeah. powerful thing to look at um but nancyberowick.com is the website and I will uh link to that on the um on the website uh, Fujicast. So yeah, website. if you if you'd like to join the Fujicast um, uh, Facebook page uh, group, please do. And um, there's there's you know one of the great things about that particular group, and I, I really believe this is that it's one of those groups where people help each other and they don't bury each other. If, for example, you get a um, you 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 get what you might consider a very simple question. Absolutely, it's um it, it's it, it's a lovely place to be. Actually, a safe place to be. It seems. I'm just looking to see how many members we've got. I did used to say that right at the top. Uh, it's something. Seven hundred and eighty. Like, uh, where are you seeing that then? Just there. <laughs> You're pointing at your screen. Well, I'm on the other side of the room. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, 780 it seems. But remember, we appreciate that not everybody is using Facebook. So I will be putting as much. I'm really, really anxious for you all to understand how much effort I'm putting into the pages now on the website. Um, it's it's a veritable fest of information. So please make sure you go to the uh, the the the, Fu the FujiCast um, podcast Facebook page and, and become a member of it. There we are. Um, well, that's it for this week. Thank you very much uh, to this week's guest, Keith Bernstein. Uh, if you've liked this week's show, please take a moment to share it. Um, we'll consider you a friend for absolute life. 
Uh, Apple Podcast Reviews. Uh, are you keeping a, an eye on the Apple Podcast Reviews? Yeah, we had a real big spike of them. Um, and so, yes, keep them coming, though. If you do like us, <laughs> please, <laughs> don't give us a review if you don't. That would be bad. Thank you for your questions. Um, they are important. Please keep sending them in, um, particularly like the ones that ha- have kind of a human angle. Actually, The tech ones are good. Don't get us wrong. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But the human angle ones are really interesting. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't written into the, the show yet and you've been thinking, oh, I'll get around to it, or oh, they'll never read my question, we will, we will. Sometimes it does take a few weeks or months. And we are going to start the calamities, which there have been very many sent to us uh, yes. in the new year. Yeah, that, that'll start the new year. So if, if you've had a particular disaster photographically, then please send that in. We're going to start the calamities in the in the, the new year. Send them into the website address. Click at fujicast.co.uk. Music from Blue Wednesday. Supporting music from Artlist. Um, and if you want to see our offerings to the photo community in the world, there's one address now, one simple address you need to go to for all our personal and business links and uh, Lady B is going to tell you that go for it B Kevin and Neil have their own websites but I thought it would be easier to give you one website address with all the links you could possibly ever need www.fujicast.co.uk <laughs> forward slash the boys the boys do you know I don't. I, I, do you know what she said immediately after we did this the other day? I, I, have I got it here? Oh yeah, here we go. I said, "Oh, Bebop." We call her Bebop. Uh, Bebop. That's her, our name for. Her. And she's. Uh, I said, "You did really, really well." And she said, "Am I getting paid for this?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I don't bebop, so you ain't got no hope. <laughs> and that, and that, we, I didn't, I didn't even ask her to say that. Uh, so send your thoughts, your questions, your feedback, uh, and anything else you like, and we will see you on the uh, the show next week. Bye bye. I'm off for a pork pie. <laughs> the Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives, who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.